Yeah, I don't think I can. I don't think I can top those. Uh, I'm always happy when Rod and Charlie and uh, David and obviously Jens invite me to come out. We've known you guys for 20 years. Um, and this time they're like, what do you want to talk on? I was like, oh, just give me a talk. And they gave me occipital cervical fusion, which is probably not my main focus. But uh, as always, when you're out there in the, uh, in the environment, this will come to you uh, in one form or another. Maybe not some of these cool cases for deformity, but in trauma and the like, especially with the aging population. So one of the things that I, you know, I think needs to be stressed is that the anatomy of the occipital cervical junction is unique. Um, you guys all know that you've been in training for a long time, but, um, you know, you really want to try to get yourself familiarized with some of the landmarks, some of the ligaments you need to know for decision making, and then uh, really helps you plan the instrumentation that you're going to put in. The anatomy is, uh, again, uh, uh, it, a very uh, important aspect of this, um, and a lot of it, even if you use navigation, you'll need to know the anatomy for uh, placement of, or accurate placement of your instrumentation. I'm very loath um, to do uh, any kind of fusion in this area. Uh, some of my partners are much more cavalier and there are certain people doing OC fusions for Elos Danlos and neck pain and other kind of subjective symptoms. And uh, I've not seen long-term that those results have been published or, you know, uh, really uh, indicated in my opinion. And I, I tend to be more conservative. But a lot of people, you know, you don't really want to lose your occipital cervical junction unless you absolutely have to. Most of your motion that you know are is in your neck and especially a lot of your compensatory uh, motion when you get older for eating and the like comes from this, uh, this area. So as you know, there's a significant amount of motion, definitely at C1, C2 in rotation primarily. Uh, but also in other uh, uh, ranges of motion. And then obviously flexion and extension, there's a significant amount uh, between the occiput and C1. So these are important things to take into consideration when you decide whether or not you want to fuse somebody and take away this motion for life from somebody. So the indications generally are, you know, in my opinion, rheumatological. Um, a lot of people uh, long-term rheumatoid arthritis, maybe not so much anymore. You guys might be lucky because the treatment for that medically has gotten better. Uh, but it's definitely when we were training and still some of the older patients have poorly managed rheumatoid arthritis and that can uh, manifest itself in some of the other cases that were shown, sort of basilar vagination um, and also pannus formation, uh, trauma is, is very common where I'm at. I am on the Upper East Side of New York and most people are old. And, you know, I would say, even though we're a level one trauma center, most of our trauma is, is usually falls and, uh, and very uh, low level stuff, but with high, uh, high results from the trauma in terms of patient impact. And then obviously some of the congenital uh, uh, issues that have been shown previously. So some of the techniques, this is probably a review for most of you. Uh, obviously the most basic one is obtaining fixation of the uh, occiput, and this will be some form of cervical plate. Uh, I tried to pick a industry neutral one, uh, but there are different uh, approaches from different companies with different um, uh, fixation points. I tend to uh, uh, be sort of the more points of fixation, the better type person. I like to have most of my points of fixation in the midline where the bone is the thickest. And I like to have uh, bicortical purchased uh, in those areas. And so I will, you know, drill slowly uh, and sequentially uh, with each uh, pass uh, two millimeters at a time until I get um, uh, feeling that I'm through the, uh, the inner cortex. Uh, even with this, uh, you know, if you don't achieve good fusion, these plates will loosen over time and the, uh, you know, revisions of these are not quite fun. So it's always better to try to get it right the first time. Obviously, uh, C1 screws, you may or may not include this in an occipital cervical uh, construct, depending on the anatomy, the pathology, and uh, sometimes these are left out, but this is a good way to get a good point of fixation. Uh, at C1, uh, here's just demonstrating, you know, kind of the standard path and starting point. Um, these are really good screws when you can get them. I only do these under navigation, like Dr. Johnson. Uh, I was trained by uh, Chris Shaffrey to do these, you know, with fluoro, 
And so I have a good understanding of the anatomy, but I will tell you, if it was me, I'd want it to be navigated. And I think it's very important to, uh, to use all the technology you have when you're placing these important screws. And then finally, you have a lot of options depending on what you need to do with C2. Um, you have the uh, pedicle screw, par screw, um, and then the uh, laminar screws, uh, one of those which I re use, used recently due to a, a vertebral artery anomaly in one of my patients. So uh, you have a lot of techniques to, to try in the lab. I would definitely practice one that you're not comfortable with. Uh, maybe uh, practice the uh, laminar screws if you don't do a lot of them. Um, but they're a good bailout, so you don't have to go to uh, C3 sometimes if you can get uh, a good uh, laminar screw. And then finally, uh, this is something that I've learned the hard way. Uh, you know, you really want to have access to a occipital cervical rod that's specific for that. There are different hinge rods. Um, there are pre-bent rods. And usually some of these pre-bent rods, if you have to bend them too much one way or the other, you may want to check the head position that you're locking somebody into. Because uh, if you're too far out of one of these, you may have uh, put somebody too much into military. You may have not had the right uh, amount of flexion or extension for them long term to be uh, at for swallowing, for head position, for uh, visualization. So always check if you have to make a lot of manipulation to pre-bent rod. And I say that because I've had to revise one of mine. So uh, first case is a case I did with uh, one of my junior partners. He followed her, it's an 85 year old lady. Uh, again, this is what we normally see. Fall downstairs at home, uh, comes in neck pain, and then has uh, you know, a significant odontoid fracture. We tend to, uh, uh, again, be very conservative where I'm at, and I would say very few people get operated on uh, quickly for uh, odontoid fractures. And so she was followed um, and then uh, was initially stable in the collar, but again, uh, did not last that long. And so uh, she's somebody that we ended up uh, progressing forward and, and performing a uh, uh, occipital cervical fusion on. And this is something that, you know, uh, when somebody fails, I think it's pretty easy to go ahead and do. Uh, you can definitely make the argument that this should have been treated in advance. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, again, she actually did well. These are some films from about three years. I think she's at 91 now and still functioning. Um, so even with an occipital cervical fusion, uh, you can still have a pretty good quality of life. And then uh, this is one of my patients. This is a 70-year-old pediatric cardiologist who just really had a minor fall at home, hit his head on the counter was immediately plegic, uh, with some improvement by the time he arrived in the ED. Um, but as you can see here, he had something brewing for a long time, and uh, he had significant compression of the spinal cord at, the, uh, at C1, uh, with obviously panis formation and the like. And so even though I'm loath to do it, uh, he really needed a occipital cervical stabilization, uh, as much reduction as we could get with a C1 laminectomy. Um, and in this case, uh, this is three years after, so he's remained stable um, into his mid-70s and actually uh, resumed sort of a part-time uh, pediatric cardiology practice. So again, I am, implore you to be uh, very aware of the anatomy before you approach this, uh, the pitfalls, the vascular issues that you can get into, how to manage those vascular issues. Um, and uh, again, navigation keeps you away from those vascular issues quite a lot if you make use of it and have accuracy. Uh, and again, choose wisely. These are quite morbid things that we're doing to somebody, but when they need to be done, they can be quite beneficial. Thank you. Very nice. Um, so two classic questions. I think you mentioned, and that was very cool that you avoided manufacturers, uh, the focus on instrumentation. But in my perspective, the biggest worry is how to get bone healing to actually occur. And I see a lot of manufacturers putting a heck of a lot of hardware around. And the art that I was taught through the great late Henry Bowman of getting an actual osseous union has been de-emphasized. What do you do to establish a good bone healing? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think uh, the uh, 
and you know i work with roger and so he, when i first started working he was still sorry <laughs> he was still doing wiring and he was wiring in uh um, some struts, which I thought was kind of humorous at the time, but in hindsight, I think actually uh, did provide a good construct for uh, for uh, uh, bony growth across the junction. So I do think that, um, you know, I decorticate a lot. I try to leave the arch of C1 when I can. Um, I, I don't use any bone morphogenic protein uh, back here. I know that some of my uh, cervical partners do. Um, but I really do struggle with uh, getting these long terms uh, to get, especially in the elderly patients, to get um, you know a, a good fusion, at least radiographically. But clinically, they've done fine. Um, and you know, so I, I guess the question is, you know, I think if you're looking at a 35 year old person that you're doing this on versus a 75 or 85 year old person, I think you have different um, sort of uh, expectations. Then the other classic question, I see a lot of craniocervical fusions. I actually find myself taking a lot of these plates out when they're not really indicated and uh, restoring craniocervical motion. But I see a lot of these being uh, put into flexion. Now, you did not do that, but how do you have a gestalt of the proper craniocervical angle when you fix somebody in that? Because a lot of these people, I think you've seen also in New York, get uh, flexed kind of. They're in a rigid uh, contraption. And it's easier to kind of uh, put the hardware in than when the head is tilted down. So how do you get a good physiologic lasting craniocervical angle interoperatively determined? Well, I don't actually have a mathematical uh, approach. I generally, you know, I use the word gestalt, which is, you know, sort of, I guess, Yiddish sort of, you know, which is where I'm at uh, in New York. But they, we, we kind of look at the angle. Um, I try to I visualize in the... Um, uh, when they're in their final position, the Mayfield pins, what they look like. I will also get a preoperative uh, CT scan to assess uh, what it looks like internally because uh, somebody uh, may look like they're fine and then I'll say, oh, you know, I probably flexed that a little bit too much or maybe I, you know, pulled it up a little bit too much and I'll release it a bit before I put it in. Um, and so that's how I, I approach it. I don't really know if you have a, a specific number or anything, but I, I, you know, I think unfortunately a little bit is trial and error as you go along, but I think if you have somebody visualizing not upwards and then also um, you know, more neutral to maybe slightly downward gaze, you generally do a little bit better. Uh, Rod changed my life because I used to do uh, Mayfield tongs and again, I use GW tongs nowadays simply and 20 pounds or whatever it takes for the patient. And that actually has a amazing uh, opportunity to kind of physiologically mm. recontour the spine so that absolute rigidity that we are all trained to espouse is actually not that necessary. So I thought Interesting. That, uh, he literally changed my life with that. I used to crawl around under the table in surgery and then readjust the head so that the occiput would be over the thoracic uh, gibbous, but no more. So, but I, uh, thanks to the, and that lab you say was so fun with Charlie. I want to thank him again for bailing me out because I came late from the OR, but uh, I think we do far less craniocervical fusions now than what we used to do, right? Kojo, you say the same thing? I, I do. I'm sort of limited to really morbid. I'm, li I'm limited to really morbid conditions. You know, it's more and more seen about C12 uh, versus occiput to subaxial. You know, it's, it's not unusual for me to see there's a, a neurosurgeon in our uh, general area who does a lot of OC fusions for ehlers Danlos, And um, so I do see some of those patients sometimes when they have trouble. And um, I, I think we're going to see more of them because the recognition of EDS is getting higher and higher. And uh, it's a challenge. Um, but, uh, sometimes, um, it's, uh, you, you know, with those patients, the, the hardware loosens and, uh, the rods break and, um, I, I think, I feel like we're going to see more and more of this. I still think that, uh, quality fusions, uh, j -Pad, maybe you can talk about that, uh, quality fusions with structural allograft, uh, properly wedged in between the occiput and C2 as necessary. I plead with all of you to not take the C2 spinous processes off unless you absolutely have to for decompression so you can uh, mount them. Charlie. 
Yeah, so I was going to say something about the allograft. So you could take structural allograft uh, from from the pelvis, uh, and you can sometimes what I do is I'll put in C1 screws, and then I'll put a cross link that uh, you know attaches to the C1 screws using the posts, you, you, you know, like that post style set screw. And then I'll bend the cross link so that it will push down on the structural allograft so that the allograft is touching the decorticated part of the skull and C2. And then I've, I've found that to be useful. Great. I think there was one question in the back. All right. Who had a question? Yes. Uh, hi, it's Felicia. Yeah, I'm a PGY5 at Brown Neurosurgery. I was just curious in, when you're doing these OC fusions, what the role is for having the patient in a pre-op halo fixation just so they can test drive their alignment and in your practice how that yeah. um, how that plays into finding the right OC alignment for them. I think that's probably a, a, a good technique for certain uh, pathologies. Obviously for somebody traumatic and you're getting urgent neurological decompression, that's probably not uh, something that that you can do, but that's probably a reasonable thing if you're if you're taking a very slow approach to things. I actually don't use a lot of halos anymore in my location, but I'm sure a, a lot of people are more uh, you know, complex than I am. All right, thank you. All right.